this thing on? Good morning. Welcome home to Alexander Baptist Church. It's great to see you all. I guess it's great to be seen. But in a, in a week or so, uh, as things begin to open up more time, uh, we'll be seeing more of you, and hopefully you'll continue to see me. But I want to welcome you this morning. Welcome home to Alexander Baptist Church. If you're on our campus in one of our parking lots, uh, or if you are joining us on social media, welcome. And then some of you will catch the feed later uh, by way of our website, or by way of YouTube, or by way of Facebook recording. So welcome in Jesus' name. It's great to see you. I've got, um, I've been working hard, you know, with, with pastors and sermon points to try to alliterate them. And, and basically, we're looking at the same first letter. So I have a three-point outline for my announcements. And they all start with G. Not all exciting, however. First of all is giving. So giving, uh, thank the Lord. Uh, giving continues to be strong and always has the Alexander Baptist Church. And we're so thankful that it continues to be. So you can still give by way of the PushPay app on your phone. Uh, you can also uh, do so through our website, abch.org. Uh, and then you can also give by mailing your check in or by delivering it in person uh, on uh, Sundays for drive-in worship. Number two, gathering. Uh, we have the opportunity to gather together in Jesus' name, and we're so thankful for that. Our gathering has been um, different, very much unusual, not anything that we could have guessed it would be. However, uh, we'll be coming uh, together officially next Sunday. And so we praise the Lord that you'll be here for that. And um, we sent an email out. And if you somehow don't get email, but you do see social media or you do uh, check out the website. If you hear this message, then please contact the church office so that we can get you a copy uh, of the letter, the email that we sent out. Also, if you're here in our parking lot today, uh, you can actually drive to the offering uh, area out front to that table, and there are some copies there. So you grab a copy, so you'll know where you need to be next Sunday. And so we're looking at uh, dividing everything up into the sanctuary, the welcome center, and the pavilion. So uh, please make note of that. And then third, the last G stands for grieving. Um, we have gone through three or four weeks of uh, grieving over the loss of of church members. To our knowledge, no one has passed away due to the virus, but we have had some members who have gone on to be with Jesus, and we rejoice in the fact that we can say that these were believers and that they are better off. Uh, however, uh, there's always the grieving process, and so uh, we lost another one of our members uh, just a day or so ago, and so we want to pray for uh, the family of Miss Betty Williams as well. But anyways, it is great to see you. We are here to worship King Jesus. So if you're live with us, praise the Lord, and uh, we get to sing Victory in Jesus. You guys ready? Amen. Let's do All right.
chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. One more time, for whoever's listening. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let us pray. Father, it is with great joy, with absolute confidence, it is with bold assurance that we come before you today. Because, Father, we know that we do not come to you in the name of a man. We do not come to you in our own name. We don't come to you under someone else's authority. But, Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Father, that through Christ we now have a relationship with you. We thank you that old things have passed away and all things have become new for those who are in Christ. We thank you, Father, that you have reconciled us to yourself through your son, Jesus. We thank you, Father, for the reconciling ministry, calling us to be ambassadors so that we would extend the plea to others be reconciled to God. Father, we praise you. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you who knew no sin were made sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in you. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Father, please meet with us in a powerful way. We would pray, Lord, for believers and disciples to be encouraged and strengthened in their faith today. And we would pray that that some would come to know Jesus today. For it is in his name that we pray. The name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
today, and hopefully you have found yourself, you know where you are, uh, please turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to be uh, traveling through verses 21 through 23, so just three verses today, and next Sunday, Lord willing, if everything works as it should, we'll be finishing up the Sermon on the Mount series next Sunday. So, uh, as we've been working through, I think... A lot of the things that, that probably struck us as powerful, maybe made us think differently. Obviously, um, the Beatitudes, very powerful, very practical, very applicational, but also extremely challenging as far as how it is that we are to live our lives. And, and I think one of the things that, that, that has most challenged me came in, in chapter 5 with this whole idea of, of a new righteousness. This righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. And when you get to chapter 7, chapter 6 ends with an encouragement telling us not to worry, uh, not to be anxious. Uh, instead, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and, and all these things will be added to you. But chapter 7, there's this I don't know, just a not a break from the other passages, but <clears throat> There is a strong transition to where Jesus kind of goes after those who are not willing to accept and embrace the new righteousness that he authors. And, and so he, he really focuses in on um, being judgmental, how we shouldn't be. Focuses in on, on what it is that we should be asking for and, and how often we should ask. We should ask repeatedly and and we should remember that our, our Father gives good gifts. Verse 12 is the golden rule. Um, whatever it is that you wish others would, would do to you, do unto them. Um, and, and then there's the, I, I would say, the going for the jugular. Um, when Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. And last week we looked at verses 15 through 20, um, the section about false prophets, fake, phony preachers and pastors. And uh, even though they look like a pastor, they might even smell like a pastor, might even dress like a pastor, definitely are, are talking like pastors. The Bible says that some of them inwardly are ravenous wolves. You need to be aware of them and recognize them by their fruits. Because every healthy tree bears good fruit, but every bad tree or diseased tree bears bad fruit. And then we come to verses 21 through 23. And, and we can look at this like we have much of the book of uh, the Sermon on the Mount in, in Matthew's Gospel, chapters 5 through 7. This, and especially the last few weeks, um, two groups. Um, we talked about two ways, two groups, two paths, two destinations, two kingdoms, two peoples. But here, it's almost like two groups at the judgment, if you would. This text reminds us that consequences can have eternal ramifications. Jesus and his followers. Jesus is giving us, giving them a, a certainty and also a clarity. Now, this is the third part to a, a salvation mini-series within the Sermon on the Mount. What constitutes genuine salvation? And of course, we understand that it is a confession that Christ is Lord. There is a, a to be a life of repentance and faith and, and embracing uh, the Word of God, the, the Son of God, the things of God, and seeking to live those things out. 
But when we look at salvation, I think what this text teaches us is that it shows us how genuine salvation is proved. And also how genuine salvation is not proved. And so, Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Father, I know that as believers we've been trained to long for the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And Father, here we see something totally different. Father, here in this text we see something awful, something terrible, Lord. Where people who appeared to follow you, people who appeared to profess Christ as Savior, people who appeared to serve you, in the end, in the judgment, Lord God, they, they don't have eternal life. They're lost. Father, I pray for clarity and for the power of God to be upon our ears and our hearts and our minds today. So that we would make sure that what we have is a genuine salvation. And that there would be no doubt that salvation is in any other other than the name of Jesus. And Father, that our salvation would be proved by doing the will of God. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. The first thing I want you to see is in verse number 21. Verse 23 as well, but we'll probably focus just on verse 21. And that is this. A genuine salvation is not proved by merely proclaiming the Lord's name. Jesus is giving us a, a glimpse into a possible situation of the judgment day. Here we see that a false profession or a false confession is a possibility for some who would claim to know the Lord. This is not uh, teaching us about people who are lost, who claim to be lost, who are atheists or agnostics, and they reject everything about the Lord or His Word. This is not them at all. These are pretenders. These are masqueraders, if you would. There is an inefficiency that is found in their walk with the Lord. Obedience versus disobedience. We have heard people say from time to time in churches, and I've kind of I've talked about it on some Sunday mornings during the series. I've also mentioned it on Tuesday and Wednesday nights as we studied the book Conversion. There are many people who believe that if you just quote a prayer or repeat someone else's words, that everything is fine. And, and certainly, you have to talk to the Lord and, and pray. And, and seek His face and, and repent of your sins and embrace Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. But there has to be Holy Spirit direction involved. There has to be life transformation involved. And so for some, it's only been verbal. And, and these are the people that Christ is talking about. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Just because you have prayed, just because you have reached out, just because you have said something, that does not guarantee your salvation, does not prove your salvation. Anyone can pray a prayer. Anyone can cry out. In verses 15 through 20, false prophets were preaching messages. In verses 22 and 23, people were prophesying. They were performing exorcisms. They were healing people in the name of Jesus, but these are the very ones who were not saved. And so we can't just base our salvation on a prayer that someone prays. You, you can't say, well, praise the Lord, they're in heaven now, because I remember one time when the pastor said, 
Who doesn't want to go to hell? That person raised his hand along with about a thousand other people and said, yep, I don't want to go to hell. And so you just pray this prayer and shazam, you're saved. Without a commitment, without repentance, without faith, it doesn't work that way. There's no such thing as easy believism. It's not what you say, it's what you do is what the Bible teaches. It's what you do with Jesus. And then after Jesus, after you accept Him as your personal Savior and Lord, it's, it's what you do with Him and how you live your life. It's not about what you say. It's not about your confession or your profession. It's not about your baptism. It's not about your church membership. All these things are important, but they're not primary. It's not who you identify with. It's not who you identify as. It's have you submitted and surrendered your heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lack of obedience that Jesus is speaking to here. Genuine salvation is not proved by proclaiming the Lord's name. Number two, genuine salvation is not proved by participating in prayer. How many people? Pray the foxhole prayer. How many people say, Lord, if you'll just get me out of this situation, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Praying a prayer doesn't guarantee salvation. For some, it is a faith that says, it is not a faith that does. And the Bible is clear that faith without works is dead. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, people are praying, they're crying out, but not every one of them will enter the kingdom of heaven. A test of genuine, of genuine Christianity is obedience and transformation. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Then who, Lord, who? Jesus says, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Genuine salvation is not proved by participating in prayer. Number three, genuine salvation is not proved by performing spiritual tasks. I mean, you look at these, this list, the big three, this is huge. But here is the day of judgment. Jesus says, on that day, there is coming a day, a day of reckoning, if you would. A day of standing before Almighty God. And of course, if you're saved, then the blood of Jesus is, 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 is what guarantees your acceptance before God. And yet here he says, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we prophesy? Did we cast out demons? Did we do mighty works? You see, external demonstrations prove nothing if there's not a heart or a life change. We know that based upon James 2.19. It says, even the demons believe there is one God and they tremble. Works do not guarantee salvation. And, and by the way, these were great works. I mean... In our day, we think, you know, just going to church, being nice, saying our prayers, giving our offering. Look, look at what these folks did. They prophesied. They preached. They cast out literal demons. And they did mighty works, which is healings and miracles and exhibited power, special, special anointings, it, it would appear. But the problem is, is that these things, if, if they did happen, which we just... We just have the, the exclamation that they say they have. The people say to Jesus, this is what we've done. And we, we know that that's not always what people have done. I don't know if you've ever told people what you've done. Sometimes we, we tend to exaggerate. You work outside in the hot sun for an hour or two, you're, you're toast. Someone comes up to you, what would you do today? I worked outside all day long. Really? All day? Like, like 7 to 3, 8 to 4, 9 to 5, what are we talking here? Well, you know, I mean, it was just hot, you know. <laughs> we, we exaggerate. Especially if you're, <clears throat> especially if you have trouble um, and, and you're, you're talking to someone on the phone and you're on hold with like a credit card company or some, there's, somebody's got your order wrong, you know, and <sighs> it's been a stressful day. Why? I was on the phone with so-and-so for three hours. Really, three hours? It's a long time to be on the phone. Well, we don't go checking phones, but you could these days. 
But it's probably 30 minutes. So we, we exaggerate. So, so maybe these people are, are exaggerating. We, we don't know. Maybe they did some spiritual-like or religious-like things. We don't know. Maybe these, these, these folks did some powerful stuff. But we know that they weren't done in the name of Jesus by his followers, or they would not have been rejected when Jesus says, I never knew you. It's interesting that Jesus says that the way that you prove your salvation is by doing the will of the Father. And these people are saying, we've done it. We preached. We healed. We cast out demons. What more do you want, Jesus? It reminds us that salvation is, was, has been, always will be a heart issue. And, and, and for them, it seems that, that they were doing the stuff in hopes to get the salvation. But we understand that you get the salvation and then you do the stuff. It's, it's not a salvation by works. It is a salvation that works. Genuine salvation is not, perform, is not uh, proven by performing spiritual tasks. Number four. Genuine salvation is not proved by presenting pastoral credentials. I mean, in any day, these would be seen as spiritual people. Like, wow, they've got some depth to themselves, it would appear. But just because you're charismatic, just because you gain a following of people, just because your, your words seem powerful, just because people latch on to your, your writings, it doesn't mean that you're genuine. It doesn't mean you're, you're not a ravenous wolf. False prophet. You might not even be saved. It's interesting. The people out there who are in spiritual leadership positions. Who seem to be spiritually perverting the word of God. These people were spiritual. They were fervent even. I mean, it's not like they were just sitting on their couches. They were out there doing stuff. Spectacular stuff. But spectacular doesn't equal salvation either. Just because you do something spectacular doesn't mean you're saved or a follower of Christ. And, and maybe, just maybe, these people were, they, maybe that's where their confidence was. Maybe their confidence was in the things that they do. And, and I have talked to numerous people over my ministry days and years I've been in ministry who, who, even though they've been in church, even though they've heard the Word of God, even though they know our church's theology, they would still say, well, I've done this. Well, I've done that. Are you saved? Well, I, I mean, I was baptized. But, but are you a Christian? Well, I mean, I'm a member of the church. Well, but are you saved? Is there a time when you committed your life to Christ? Do you know how many people I help? Do you know how much money I've given to the church? How many Sunday school classes I've taught? There is still this fundamental error within the hearts and minds of many church people who don't understand that salvation is not by works. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Genuine salvation is not proved by presenting pastoral credentials. Number five. Genuine salvation is proved only by faithful obedience. In verse 21 it says... Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. I think, I think many times when we look at this text, we look at all the negative and we, we see that all the, you know, the things that were done, that they, they were weighed and found wanting and, and it just didn't work. And we, we get to verse 23, you know, I'm going to declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. But we, we forget the second part of verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. On that day, we skip over it. On that day, many will say to me, Jesus says, I departed and never knew. But that, that phrase, that clause, it says, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Salvation is proven by faithful obedience. Not a salvation by works, but one that works. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. That's the salvation. Verse 10 is the faithful obedience, for we are his workmanship, Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In the book of James, chapter 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, 
If someone says he has faith, says he's a Christian, says he's saved, but does not have works, can that kind of faith save him? And the answer is no. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of them says, go in peace, be filled and be warmed, without actually helping them, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Genuine salvation is proved only by faithful obedience. Faithful obedience to the will of God proves salvation. Look at the alternative. Jesus says, and then I will declare to them, there is a word, a, a, a declaration of, of severe finality, the ultimate finality. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. You, you might have fooled your friends, you might have fooled your family, you're not going to fool the Lord. Your, what you have been basing your salvation on is insufficient. You are in error. I never knew you. You were never saved. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. This is not about Christians losing their salvation. That is a false teaching. You can't lose what God has already done for you. But here we see that some were not genuinely converted. I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. You rebels against the law of Almighty God. And what happens here is there is an eternal separation from Christ in a place called hell. And at the judgment, this is teaches at the judgment, religious ways and religious words are of no value. The only thing that is of value is a personal relationship and commitment to Jesus Christ. I thought we'd just take a few moments. Because I know, I know when I get excited, sometimes I go a little bit fast. So I want to, I don't want to jog you through some scriptures. That's what I would like to do. But I want to walk you through some instead. So John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Clear. Clear path. The only way to the Father is with Jesus, through Jesus. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus. In, in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Nor is there salvation in any other. This declaration about it being in Christ alone. There is no name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So there's, there's no name, there's no way to be saved other than through the Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 10, beginning in verse 7, Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came, who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. In John chapter 14, in verse number 15, Jesus says this, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Some believe that this should be written, If you love me, keep my commandments. Some believe that it should be written as a, as a conditional command or a conditional statement. There's confusion. 
Um, I like both. If you love me, then keep my commandments. Or, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You'll prove your commitment to me. In John chapter 10, Jesus answered in verse 25, I told you and you do not believe the works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe it because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Whenever we come across texts like this, there's, there's always the, the challenge or the struggle of, you know, I, I don't want to make any Christian doubt their salvation. I want to get every Christian to be assured of their salvation. Paul says to work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. And, and maybe that needs to happen. I mean, I mean honestly, if, if, you can, if you can look at and just kind of observe your life and what happened to you at your moment of conversion. And if there was no change, if you just did what somebody else told you to do. Then, then maybe you need to really consider this text. Because the last the last thing in the world that you would ever want to get wrong is salvation. And, and then, if you are a believer and you have been certainly that, you talk about encouragement. To know that there is nothing that can take you away from Jesus. That, that, that there's nothing that can separate you from the Father. This is huge. The confidence, the, the assurance, the comfort and the peace that come from knowing Christ as our Savior and Lord and knowing that we're never going to die. That, that when we physically stop dying spiritually, we go on forever in the presence of God. So what? The so what from this text, number one, is be saved. If you are not, if you have depended upon anything in your life other than Jesus to save you, then let today be the day that you get saved. Let today be the day that you truly turn away from your sin and self and give your life to Christ. Let Him take full control. Be saved. Don't trust in your works. Don't trust in your name. Don't trust in someone else or something. Don't trust in anything other than Christ alone. So what number two? Be obedient. Believers, we should be obedient. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Are, are we lovers of Christ? Are we obedient? And here's the thing. We prove our salvation to others through our obedience. Well, we don't prove it to God. God already knows, right? But we prove our salvation to others. The last thing we would ever want, if you're truly saved and you love Jesus, I mean, if you're truly a believer, the last thing you would ever want is for someone to look at your life and, and wonder, huh, I wonder, I wonder if, it, if they're saved. I can't tell. It's the last thing you want. Well, and then the last, last thing you want is depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for the clarity of your word. Thank you, Father, for your goodness toward us. Thank you, Lord, for your rescue your deliverance, your salvation. Please extend your peace to your people. And Lord, we pray for the convicting power of the Holy Spirit for those who are lost. This will be the day of salvation. 
Father, help us to remember that your ways are not our ways. And help us to trust you. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. It's my prayer that as we as we move forward in our text, but just as we move forward in life, I mean, who would have thought that we would be doing drive-in worship and not meeting together for months? Who would have thought? Seems like just yesterday we entered into 2020. We're talking about, you know, all the cliches of having perfect vision. Nobody saw it. Now, who would have thought we were in the middle of May and we're still not meeting together? It's tough. So again, keep up your giving. Uh, also look for the note, uh, the email, or the letter uh, that will describe our, our next three weeks of gathering. And then also remember that there's a lot of people hurting, even in our own church. And let's grieve. No, we don't grieve as those who have no hope. But let us uh, grieve the loss of our loved ones and pray for their family members. Okay? Love you all. It's been great to be with you. And we're going to close out. What, what shall we sing? We're going to change it up a little bit. We're going to sing a song called The Blessing. It's a song that puts a benediction to words. So just receive this blessing. Oh,